All right, you all know your orders. When you see the Taliban come over the horizon, you open fire immediately. Okay, so when I see Pat Tillman come over the horizon, I shoot him. No, no, no. When you see the enemy come over the horizon, you shoot the enemy. Okay, good. Now repeat it back to me. Okay, I shoot Pat Tillman, then run over the horizon. No, he's on our side. You charge the enemy. Right, then shoot Pat Tillman. No, 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 no. Okay, well, you, you know, you're going to have to explain it to me again, because it sounds to me like I'm repeating back to you exactly what you're telling me, and obviously you're hearing something different. So just w w one more time. <sighs> Okay. When you see the Taliban come over the horizon, you shoot them. All right, so I shoot Pat Tillman and then run when the Taliban show up. No, you shoot the Taliban, not Pat Tillman. Got it? Got it. You sure? Yep. All right. Hey, you know where I can find Pat Tillman? It's Britney, bitch. And uh, the Iraq, everywhere, like, such as. I'm supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Our next door neighbors are foreign countries. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. There's just maybe no better argument for destroying your childhood journals before they can be included in a book about your life. Because I feel like half the Krakauer book is him being like, he's so intelligent. He's just so well read. And then they'll include these passages from his journal that are just like, not a lot of hot chicks on the beach in France. <laughs> a little disappointing. Okay, <laughs> I, will, like, I will defend Pat. There are some <laughs> insightful journal entries, but... Yes, yeah. there are also like him talking about the McDonald's in Europe and how they're different from the McDonald's <laughs> back home. This is just Travis Kelsey on Twitter in 2010. <laughs> Truly. Yeah, it's like definitive power rankings of cheeseburgers abroad or something. And you're like, why is like, what is this serving here? For a while, I was like, oh, I'm going to keep a journal and I'm going to be consistent about it. And then I noticed that all I was writing about was girls and like my love life. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to write about meaningful things. I'm not writing in my journal if it's about girls. And then, of course, I just. <laughs> <laughs> Never wrote in it after that. <laughs> <laughs> what else is there to write about? Like you said, there's a lot of really insightful stuff. He clearly was journaling for his whole life. And so you see this transformation kind of happen mm -hmm. over time. But the, yeah, some of the early stuff is just, it's very like watching Donnie Darko for the first time, kind of big brain teenage thoughts of just like, I just feel like, you know, it's like everyone's got their own interior life. Just like kind of crazy to think about. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> like, you know, he's, he's kind of just discovering consciousness and everybody and maybe this is best to be lost to the sands of time i just open to an almost random page from like 200 for one of his journal entries and it's like 2003 one year from his death and this meathead football player writes so use all that is called fortune most men gamble with her and gain all and lose all as her wheel rolls a political victory a rise of rents the recovery of your sick or the return of your absent friend or some other favorable event raises your spirits and you think good days are preparing for you do not believe it nothing can bring you peace but yourself <laughs> nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles come the law. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's like doing introspection on the transience of life and the nature of fate and also it's like man i really don't like the vice verse compared to the brat verse in germany <laughs> 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 well, dude, I think also the crazy thing is thinking that he's writing this stuff next to some 18-year-old huffing computer duster <laughs> in, like, some forward operating base. I think that's the biggest, maybe, like, saddest or part of this story outside of the actual, like, friendly fire incident is just having these these dreams of being surrounded by, like, like-minded, strong-willed warriors mm -hmm. and then kind of being thrown into boot camp with these kids who are basically given, like, jail or army contracts. Hey everybody, it's your Remember Shuffle. My name is Ben. With me as always is my co-host Jordano. Hello. Hi. Okay, why that voice today? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm an <laughs> operator. Uh, nice. Okay, you're a sad operator. And today we have our first four mic episode in a really long time. We are joined by Al from Brooklyn. Say hi, Al. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Returning guest <laughs> from our Iraq War episode. And we are joined by Tommy. Say hi, Tommy. How's it going, guys? Doing great. Thanks for having me. No worries. We're very excited for this episode. This episode will be about Pat Tillman. This is our very special episode, TM. You're you're probably going to get fewer bits and bants because this story is legitimately tragic. As Giordano said, it starts with 9-11 and then gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> 
But the story of Pat Tillman, the NFL player who walked away from a massive contract to enlist in the army to fight in the war on terror, is fascinating. And it's fascinating because he really isn't the meathead, blockhead, knuckle-dragging, red-blooded American <laughs> patriot you might assume that he is. Yeah, I think when you hear that story of a guy who quit the NFL after hearing about 9-11 to join the military, you have a certain view of, of what that guy must be like. But he is really like a complex and a tragic figure. One of the most famous parts of this book is that he's emailing Noam Chomsky and setting up <laughs> meetings with him after his deployment is done so that he can talk about how the war might have been illegal. Yes. And the other reason we're doing this is this is a 2000 podcast and this is a beautiful microcosm of that particular historical moment. The insane war fervor that gripped the country that definitely probably had some effect in Pat Tillman enlisting in the military. Also, the general maliciousness of the Bush era, well, I mean, the U.S. military generally, but especially the Bush era U.S. military, because after Pat Tillman's friendly fire death in Afghanistan, there was a cover up. And we will be talking about that, too. To prepare for this episode, you know, cards on the table, cite your sources or else it's plagiarism. We read John Krakauer's Where Men Win Glory. We also paged around some sections of the Looming Tower and watched a documentary called The Tillman Story, as well as a few other things. I once heard a joke that among types of podcasts, you have your uh, comedians yelling over each other or non-experts do a book report on a history book. And so this is kind of a book report episode. <laughs> Just so I can set everybody up for the order of the episode, we're going to start with our intro slash hook, as we always do. And then we'll give a plot summary for this, which we normally don't do on the pod, but people aren't familiar enough with this story. And so we'll just move through Pat's life. Uh, and then some of the big ideas that we'll get into first, like Pat's idealism versus the cynicism that he should have had. Secondly, we'll do a debate on who killed Pat Tillman and why. Then uh, a character study on him, like why he makes for such an interesting character for a biography. And then finally, Pat's obsession with challenging himself. The, and then the actual final theme, which is something we're calling Pat Taliban, and just speaking about how John Krakauer, like whether intentionally or unintentionally, seems to have painted a picture of Pat Tillman and the Taliban being sort of mirror images of each other in certain ways. Yeah, it's the Austin Powers, we're not so different, you and I. <laughs> and then we'll finally, we'll just joke a bit about the U.S. military as a bureaucracy and how like this story did involve like Armando Iannucci levels of just insane Kafka as bureaucracy. So let's trace the history first and foremost, because I think Pat Tillman has been a little bit memory hole, unless you were like a huge football fan or a real news head in the decade. This is not a story that I think a ton of people know intimately. Yeah, it's a fairly unpopular section of the show, usually when we just describe the plot of the, the movie we're watching. But it is necessary for Pat Tillman, because even if you've read the book, it was probably a while ago, and, and we'll just catch you up on what's going on here. So the first few chapters of the book are not actually crucial for understanding the, the friendly fire story, but they are important for understanding the character study of Pat Tillman. And they do a really good job of showing you Pat's life in California, growing up in high school and playing football in college, and then switching back and forth between that and Afghanistan leading up to the NFL and, and the war on terror. So each chapter will alternate between Pat's life as the college football star and then some figure in the Mujahideen. And I thought that was very effective. I was actually like looking forward to the Afghanistan chapters more than the chapters in the United States. It was really interesting. Yeah, they get into, obviously, Operation Cyclone, which was the CIA plan to flood Afghanistan with money and guns. And I hate to go on a digression before we even get started, but for any, like, normie boomer that you talk to who is going to dispute the blowback of the Mujahideen making al-Qaeda and terrorism happen, here's a crazy fact from the book that blew my mind. In 1993, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed tries to blow up the World Trade Center building. Six people are killed, but a thousand are injured but mostly the news laughs it off could you believe it one bomb in the bottom thought he could knock down the whole thing ha 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 so incompetent but Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was trained in a CIA run camp in Afghanistan and he had a CIA printed bomb making manual <laughs> it's like something out of a fucking naked gun movie like a shtick prop <laughs> the CIA manual that this guy had that is how direct the link is between America making its own boogeymen to fight CIA made their own anarchist cookbook yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
But back to Pat Tillman. Pat grows up. He's in this Coo Road, small town outside San Jose. He's got a couple of brothers. They're all rascals. He goes ham on athletics. He's a guy who can't stop climbing things, even from a young age. Daredevil. Risk taker. In high school, he plays all three phases of football, offense, defense, special teams. And then he goes to college. He transitions to just linebacker defense. He plays for Arizona State University. Go Sun Devils. And he's this ambitious guy. He's got a 3.8 GPA. He marries his high school sweetheart. This lady he met when he was four years old and so without getting too like worshipy of the guy that's the kind of guy that he is he's on that grind he's got this old school morality code he's short at only 511 short for a football player (laughs) but he's the kind of guy who makes up for this in athleticism he hits hard and he can read offenses and then when he goes from college to pro he's a guy who switches positions again going from linebacker to first free then strong safety so super ambitious guy super accomplished athlete yeah and he's undersized so he makes the nfl in the last round and he works his way up you know someone who's usually drafted in the last round of the nfl draft will will typically get cut and not only does he end up starting by the end of the season but there are certain news reporters who even say that he's a pro bowl level player so he's he's an exceptional strong safety especially for a guy who's undersized he has an excellent game sense and if you watch him play the hits that he delivers are inspired (laughs) (laughs) yeah crazy fact away from the book in the training camp when he's playing to make the roster as a seventh round guy he literally ends someone else's career because he destroys their knee in (laughs) practice christ in the fucking training camp he's got that dog in him (laughs) (laughs) he does indeed And then 9-11 happens, and he decides he's going to finish the season and quit to join the Army. He turns down a $3.6 million contract extension from the Arizona Cardinals and goes to Iraq. And I think that that's probably the part of the story that everybody is familiar with. But what they don't really know is his motivations to do that, because he keeps that mostly to himself. He doesn't do any interviews. Actually, the Arizona Cardinals sort of betrayed him by putting out a video of him explaining his reasons. But it seems like, from what I could tell, first of all, he comes from a military family. Family. I think that that's pretty important to understand that he feels a responsibility. You know, if the country's at war, the people in his family are going to be there. Fremont Lieutenant Dan. Fremont, California Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's crazy that he doesn't give any interviews to the media. So this guy, he's not thinking to himself like Elvis did, right? I'm going to make a huge show of joining the military and that's going to boost recruitment, which will be good for the cause. This guy thinks to himself, I can do a ton of good as a soldier as one guy soldiering over there is his thought process and what Giordano mentioned briefly is this interview is the Cardinals they recorded on 912 all of these players reactions and then they didn't release it and they sat on it until after Pat Tillman's death when they released it to try and turn him into this patriotic Superman or whatever which was very much not what he was all about you do see him kind of grappling too with this sense of being a football player during that time in that interview the sense of feeling like he's playing a game while the rest of the world is doing something more meaningful. Yes. And you can kind of see it in that video, him sitting with this and sort of struggling to reconcile these two things where he's incredibly successful on the field and he's a professional athlete, but he feels very unfulfilled spiritually and that he's, he feels he's not making enough of an impact in a meaningful way. Yeah, he feels like his job in the NFL is meaningless. He's like, right. it's nothing compared to contributing to some kind of greater crisis. cause. Yeah. yeah. Higher, nobler cause. Right. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. like Which- the Iraq war. <laughs> <laughs> well the war right. in Afghanistan he, he does join because of the war in Afghanistan because of Afghanistan That's yeah true. and he does get sent to Iraq which he, he's not happy about but yeah he's almost immediately disillusioned <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. almost almost immediately sent to the wrong place <laughs> right out of the gate Pat enlists with his brother which will be very important later but his brother Kevin joins him and they're only 14 months apart they're super close their whole lives and they go through basic training together and they eventually go to ranger training they, they become rangers and And training is difficult for him because he's a bit older than the rest of the recruits, right? And he is on this idealized patriotic mission, and he's surrounded by the characters that we talked about in our Generation Kill episode. Grunts. Grunts, yes. Morons. Simpletons. (laughs) And so he he reminds them all the time, like, hey, I didn't give up an NFL contract to come here and dick around with you guys. Right. I'm here for more than just rip fuel. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. I was reading this book, and I was like, well, actually, you did. That's exactly what you did because that's what the army is 
is. To take away the teenagers dicking around element of the army would be to take away the army. Yeah, it's a it's a youth subculture, right? Like he's coming in as like the older guy, like the 25 year old brother who's like, can you guys keep it down? You know, <laughs> and that guy is going to be super popular at, uh, you know, basic infantry training or uh, the jump course. <laughs> And can we can we say? I mean, I can cut this out later, but can we say you were in the army? Uh, y- yeah, I, I I do have experience with the NATO military. That is correct. I'll say that first of all, like I I maintain that the stupidest people are the people who work in like a warehouse. Like I knew a guy who didn't know the difference between flammable and inflammable. He was notionally <laughs> responsible for handling the warehouse. Doctor um, Nick ass. No, it was it was a Simpsons meme, honestly. Medic Nick. Yeah, for real, for real. But I'll, I'll say that I th- I think the impulse here, and we'll probably get to this later, is that Pat Tillman's like a red blood guy who like it, it, it's like that you know i know he's canceled but it's like that louis ck bit where it's like he believes in this as obviously as we can see you know with a hindsight of 20 plus years kind of what the reality is that in post 9 11 america can you blame someone who's like a 20 something year old man for being like i'm gonna serve my country and i'll say that with the blaring propaganda like this guy's a californian <laughs> and even he's like all right let's do this yeah a californian atheist and he's doing this right i think i read the book initially when i was like 18 or something and i definitely did not have the correct takeaway i think at that time i think i left being like hoorah let's, let's <laughs> you know like that's how malleable you know what i mean like there's that reading of this story that you can still come away feeling however you want to feel mm-hmm. almost if you kind of like brush over the the facts <laughs> the facts exactly right you can make this story feel like and that's exactly why we fight or you can be horrified i think reading it when i was younger the same way as watching like black hawk down or something you can feel fired up watching something like that it speaks to some like base instinct in you that's pretty ugly and kind of scary for sure and that's what makes the book so good and like we'll get into later is that we tend to put pat up on this pedestal but as his family points out when you do that you are stripping him of his humanity and Mm -hmm. he very much had regular human reactions to things like you just described and on his first mission pat is sent to guard a tent while everybody else went on the mission and he's livid Mm -hmm. and this is a quote from the book Mm -hmm. here the fact that pat believed the Iraq war to be illegal and unjust did not prevent him from wanting to get into the fight to prove himself in combat. Being left in the tent was also a rude slap to his ego. He said in his journal, I feel like the last kid picked. I want to fucking hurt something. I threw away or postponed a great deal to come here, broke the rules in a way. Everything here is on time and rank, not aptitude. Fuck this place. That speaks to him and his inability to like jive with an infantry corps because really like you should just be happy you got to sit down. I'm just saying. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, this was a thing in generation kill too that especially that first mission you've been training for months or years and all you want to do is fucking discharge your weapon and he felt that too even if at this point he knows that the war is illegal and unjust and he's still like fuck i want to be in there i want to be shooting <laughs> so yes as Drew said pat is first sent to iraq even though he enlisted for afghanistan he enlists in the spring of 2002 and then basic training and ranger training bring us through most of a year to 2003 when the Iraq war starts. So he doesn't even get sent to the war he wants. And I just want to read a quote because I think it gets lost in the sauce a little bit how much he was opposed to this war. So I'm going to read, this is John Krakauer quoting from Pat Tillman's journal written February 22nd, 2003. Pat Tillman writes, it may be very soon that Nub, that's his nickname for his brother, Nub and I will be called upon to take part in something I see no clear purpose for. Were our case for war even somewhat justifiable no doubt many of our traditional allies would be praising our initiative however every leader in the world with a few exceptions tony blair is crying foul as is the voice of much of the people this leads me to believe that we have little or no justification other than our imperial whim of course nub and i have willingly allowed ourselves to be pawns in this game and will do our job whether we agree with it or not all we ask is that it is duly noted that that we harbor no illusions of virtue. This is not how he was remembered, right? This man made direct appeals to how he wanted to be remembered in terms of his service and his actions that were just flatly ignored by the military. But back to the narrative at hand. Yeah, I think like the first story that really starts to paint a picture of what's going to happen is the Jessica Lynch rescue story. If you recall, this is the woman who was rescued from a hospital. There's that famous picture of her being brought
brought out on a stretcher. So what happens with Jessica Lynch is that her unit makes a wrong turn in the early days of the invasion of Iraq and gets captured. And it's important to note that she got hurt because they were in a firefight, but the car that she was in crashed. And so she's hurt because of that. And they send this rescue mission to save her. And Pat, who is actually involved in the mission, sort of on the periphery, mentions that everything about this feels like a media blitz. We're sending hundreds of people to save one person. They delayed the mission by a day to make sure that there was a camera crew here. And he's like, this is bullshit. And of course, you know, what happens is this story comes out and the U.S. military tells the Washington Post, you know, this is a running theme in the last couple episodes we've done. The U.S. military will just tell news sources things and they will just repeat it verbatim, regardless of whether or not it's true. But the story is that she fought to the death. She emptied all of her magazines before she was captured. She was stabbed. She was raped. She was tortured. And then the U.S. military stormed the hospital and bravely recaptured her. But what you find out later, and of course, it doesn't have the same sensationalist headline to it, was that she was at the hospital because her her capturers were giving her medical treatment (laughs) and that she was not tortured or stabbed or raped and that she didn't discharge her weapon before being captured. And yeah, doctors were basically taking care of her at the hospital. And so when the U.S. saved her, they didn't even have to fire a shot. They just Mm. walked into the hospital. There was nobody guarding it. They asked the front desk, where is Jessica Lynch? (laughs) And they said she's on the third floor, and they said thanks. And they, uh, yeah, they went up and and they, they they checked her out in a wheelchair. The whole thing was all made up, basically, and it was shot in that classic combat crew style, right? Shaky cam, mm-hmm. you know, found footage of Jessica Lynch's rescue. Yeah, and this is where the book introduces the character of Jim Wilkinson, who I think is one of the more interesting characters uh, of the story because he's this young guy in the Bush administration in the Office of Communications whose job is basically Basically, he's in the office of manufacturing consent. His job is to come up with good stories that they can leak to the media. And the Jessica Lynch story, he's all over that. He's also, by the way, the guy who invented the lie that Al Gore claims to have invented the internet. And yeah, he's responsible for the Jessica Lynch story and a lot of what happens to Pat Tillman. And so he is responsible for turning these army actions into viral media events so that he can go to Judith Miller and selectively release classified info, the fact that she fought to the death, without the full context of this being an unverified source. Because of course the media will eat it up because they are in the business of selling newspapers and no one is buying newspapers. There's like some great clips from Fox News people who are just almost gleeful where they're like, she's being torn. Tortured. She's being raped. As they talk about Jessica Lynch, just total propaganda. Yeah, some of the people they had to ignore for this story is wild too. Like, I think one of the people who died in this mission was the first Native American woman to die in the U.S. Army, and of course Jessica Lynch gets all the attention because she's a blonde woman from West Virginia. Yeah, right. Really? Exactly. Yeah. And so Pat is starting to get a little pilled about this whole operation. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, he writes in his journal that it's fucking illegal. He makes plans to meet with Noam Chomsky after he returns from deployment. And he gets his first break from uh, his first tour. I think if you're in the Rangers, you do short three and a half month tours, but you do a lot of them. And once he comes home from his first tour, he actually has the opportunity to leave the U.S. military early. The NFL works out a deal with the Army because, of course, the Army doesn't really need him over there, (laughs) right? Like they need him as a recruiting tool. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, I signed up for two tours. I would never even consider leaving early yeah this is going to be a recurring theme of pad is he has this insanely archaic idealistic honor code giordano mentioned he turned down the contract extension from the cardinals that was like 3.2 or 3.6 mil whatever it was we didn't mention that before that he had an offer from the st louis rams the greatest show on turf in the early 2000s (laughs) coming fresh off of a super bowl they offered him 9.2 million dollars but his agent said this is a great deal Deal, you need to take this and pat tillman said no i'm gonna stay with the arizona cardinals a cellar dweller team i think they had one winning season in all of his years there because this team believed in me and took a risk on me and drafted me in the seventh round and his agent is like they're going to pay you the league minimum and sure enough they did which for him given his experience in the league the league minimum for him was five hundred and twelve thousand dollars. so this guy turned down 9.2 mil for for honor for the sake of honor and here he is doing it again he's so 
showing this honor bound, your word is your bond thing to people that he knows are liars. It's insane. Yeah, he's almost painfully principled and it's hard to watch unfold as you read the book or watch the, the doc because you kind of know where it's all headed. But it's like every aspect of his life was treated that way. Like there's stories of him getting blackout drunk with his buddies in France and then mm-hmm. going on a 12 mile run the next day because he had these personal rules mm-hmm. that he had to follow. It was all like nothing's going to stop me from sticking to the schedule or from completing my goal or down to like the most minute detail of his life. And uh, yeah, and often it was great personal costs financially and leaving his wife to go fight. I mean, just all of it. Yeah. And so he does return to Afghanistan and Afghanistan is in a tough spot at this time <laughs> because all the focus has shifted to Iraq. Actually, it's I mean, it's in a tough spot always, but <laughs> like, for the past 40 or so years, <laughs> yeah, it's been a real tough half century it's for a, Afghanistan. It's a real tough neighborhood. <laughs> And all the focus has shifted to Iraq, material, personnel. And this is an occupation mission at this point. So the tactics, from what I understand, are basically just to walk around from village to village, waiting for the Taliban to ambush you so that you can fight back. And Afghanistan has these insane mountain switchbacks that were just as frustrating for Alexander the Great as it was for the United States military, because like radios won't work because of the way that the canyons are. And so here's where we'll actually get to the biggest incident of the book, which is he's in a unit and one of their Humvees breaks down. And they can't just leave it there because they they need it. You know, they they can't lose a Humvee. It's also the radio. I actually know someone who got a combat commendation for destroying a radio fleeing from a vehicle. So that's like one of the bigger things. They don't want to leave like radios and signals equipment behind. No gear left behind. It's the motto of the armed forces. (laughs) (laughs) And so it's decided from, I think, a lieutenant colonel that they will split the unit in two. Some will tow the Humvee, and some will carry on with the mission to check the neighboring village for our weapons. So the two groups are called Serial 1, Serial 2. Both of them need to go through this high-walled canyon before they split their separate ways. Pat Tillman is in Serial 1. Pat Tillman's brother, Kevin Tillman, is in Serial 2. Serial 1 makes it through the canyon. Easy peasy, no incidents. But then they hear shooting from Serial 2 somewhere back there. So they run back into the canyon because they think that their comrades are under fire. And this is when Pat Pat Tillman is shot and killed. It should be noted they're operating with the local uh, Afghan National Army. So some guy in the second echelon moving forward basically just sees the dude with a beard. And, you know, like typically speaking in the military your country, like once someone starts shooting at something, I guess everyone probably should. So effectively, they see a dude with a beard and start shooting at what is a friendly local unit. And then some of their American homies come back and it doesn't go too well. It's a big part of the excuses that came up after the fact was that you sort of you shoot wherever your commanding officer shoots and that you you look where your commanding officer looks. As soon as that started to unfold, it just kept going. It was like a freight train. So suddenly everyone's shooting. So just sort of out of nowhere. Yeah. And the commanding officer shoots at the person in the Afghani army who's in the uniform of the friendly <laughs> Afghani right. army that we're trying to train for like Afghanization. And that's a good enough reason for him to be like, the threat! <laughs> Get him! And it's like, yeah. how often did this happen? That mm-hmm. we just shot someone in the Afghani army because they looked Afghani. Because I was scared. (laughs) Yeah. And so they're taking a bunch of fire, Pat and his unit. And Pat is trying everything he can to tell them, like, you are shooting at Americans. Stop. And so he throws out a smoke grenade. He's calling out to them. And he finally steps out and his last words are, stop shooting. I'm Pat Tillman. I'm Pat fucking Tillman. And gets shot many, many times. (laughs) Yeah. It's so grim. In the dock, they explain he pops a smoke grenade he's thinking and the shooting stops for a second but it's only so that the americans could reposition and get a better angle (laughs) oh my god that was sort of the most bizarre part of all that was they said that they were waving their hands and at one point someone testified that he saw two hands raised and then basically (laughs) reloaded and kept shooting and the court was like stunned why would you do that what possible reason could you have for that and it's the same thing with the smoke grenade does the taliban typically pop smoke grenades not only that and the friendly color people typically have a similar color and exactly like from the same crate of smoke grenades so one would think oh, jesus yeah and they're shooting a gun by the way that's a 50 cal gun that shoots 900 rounds a minute and they do so for what the soldiers say was at least one minute yeah brutal brutal stuff pat didn't have a head after 
murder. They were looking at the body and it was just, it had been obliterated by, yeah, so many bullets. There's a really horrifying part of that doc where I forget who was pinned down with them behind the... O'Neill. The rock. O'Neill. And um, I'd say he heard what he thought was running water and it was Pat's blood. Just this like horrible, again, and, and from such a close proximity too, which I think we'll get into too, but the official narrative kind of starts to fall apart where they seem pretty clearly visible and clearly like, identified between the smoke and screaming and waving their hands and, and for whatever reason, just they kept firing. Thus ends the lighter part of the story. <laughs> Right. Jesus. Now we're going to get into the darker part of the story, which is that the U.S. military tries to keep not only the family from finding out, but the country at large, that this was a friendly fire incident. Friendly fire incidents do happen. I was reading yesterday that something like up to 40% of casualties in Iraq are friendly fire. And so it is impossible to not have friendly fire incidents, but it would technically be possible to not have cover-ups, I suppose, you know, in theory. <laughs> Those aren't accidents. It got worse every war, too. I found it was 21% of casualties in World War II were friendly fire, 39% in Vietnam, 52% in the first Gulf War, and then, yeah, like you said, 41 and 13 between Iraq and Afghanistan. Wow. Um, it seems bizarre that as technology advances, somehow incidents of <laughs> friendly fire increase, yeah. because I think it is so removed, you're not really like actually face-to-face with True. an enemy. It's, it's you know, not to have a often. friendly fire close combat injury, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> right, right, right. A friendly fire musket injury. <laughs> and there's a chapter that Krakauer devotes to a separate friendly fire incident in the Iraq war not involving Pat Tillman to show you how weak-willed these friendly fire incidents are investigated. They do focus on this friendly fire incident in the Battle of Nazaria where this bomber obliterates an American unit, or a fighter rather, and they get into what the investigation is like and yeah the investigation is just extremely weak-willed i guess apparently these jet fighters have like body cam footage and so you should just be able to watch the tape because the americans that got bombed were signaling to the plane with flags and smoke and anything they could find to be like stop shooting at us and one of the pilots was like hey can i bring this tape home i just want to watch it again and they were like yeah sure (laughs) and then the next day he's like oh i'm so sorry i taped over it smallville was on i and i wasn't able to watch i had to tape it yeah lex luther he's bad in this one (laughs) i think that happened with the a10 warthog footage of the yes that's what it was yeah and an a10 warthog is literally a plane built around a gatling gun yeah (laughs) yeah and then the other tape just disappeared yeah as they often do so just getting back to pat for a second the moment of the book that i think hit me the most was when his brother kevin finds out that pat's dead because at the end of the day kevin keeps asking like where's my brother where's my brother is he okay and he can't get a straight answer out of anyone because they've decided slash have been told to not tell him and finally one guy and the medic are like we can't take this anymore fuck it he deserves to know and the medic says to him I need to take your gun to tell you this. You can't be holding this right now. And yeah, they have to tell him that his brother was killed. And it's worth emphasizing, Pat ran back to Serial 2 because he heard gunfire and he knew that his brother was in that unit. He ran back to save his brother. And he asked to drop his body armor to run faster. Yes. Basically, and was and was denied. I mean, that his first thought is like, I can run faster with less armor into mm-hmm. this firefight. And we should note about the firefight in general that there is no confirmation. There is still debate. There's no confirmation that there was any Taliban present at all. There are many people in the units who believe that there wasn't any enemy around. They were just reacting to seeing each other. And and it was the it was the Spider-Man be pointing at each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so grim. And so then begins the cover-up attempt from the government, which starts, like I said, right away with the attempt to obfuscate to his own brother, who's in the same unit, what had happened. Yeah, and before his body is cold, Pat Tillman was so crazy that he is so honest and upright with the military even when he knows that they are liars so on his forms like on his will that he did he said he wanted no military involvement in his funeral and he ticked the box and said i don't want to be buried in arlington because he did not want to be a symbol he just wanted to do his part and he had to smuggle a copy of this to his wife to make sure she had the information but the military tried to swindle her tried to say we want to bury him in arlington we want to like roll out the red carpet and turn this into a propaganda win and they tried to lean on her thinking that she'd be so grief stricken she'd go along with it but she stood her ground that didn't stop john mccain from crashing the memorial service 
though. All these politicians still crash the funeral, even if it wasn't official military or what have you. Yeah, and Pat is worried about this. He, he tells people, like, I have this vision after I die of the military parading me around the country. That is not what I want. Those are my express wishes. <laughs> Please respect them. Yeah. And the military's reaction is like, and you know, this is their worldview and maybe someone can make a case for it. But what they tell the family and the way they see it is like, this is not your son's death. It is not for you, the funeral. This is for us. We can get a lot out of this and it's no longer about you and your grief. It is about what the military can get out of this. Right. This is American's funeral. Explicitly, his brother is told by a colonel that even though evangelical prayers are not necessarily what the Tillman family wants, uh, this colonel insists that that has to happen when he when his body's wheeled off the plane. So, I mean, the level of just not listening to a living will here is somewhat institutional. Yeah, and this is all happening during like a controversy that I had forgotten, but the doc pointed out to me. Someone got fired for taking photos of the coffins coming out of the planes. That was considered too much of a violation of privacy to take a photo of the flag draped caskets of soldiers. But for Pat Tillman, fuck privacy. What privacy, right? We're going to do whatever we want for this man's memorial funeral. We're going to steal this family's grieving away from them. I mean, yeah, we'll we'll put it in post, but you have John McCain talking about how Pat's up in heaven and, you know, satisfied or whatever. Yeah. And Pat's youngest brother, not the one who was in the military but the baby of the family got up there drinking a guinness because pat loved to drink and was always giving people gifts and he just says he's not in heaven he's fucking dead that his brother is awesome you got people out there sort of speaking in these glittering generalities pat your family doesn't have to worry anymore you are home you are safe and you will not be forgotten and then you've got a brother coming up there somebody who's willing to speak the brutality of that reality for them uh i didn't write shit because uh i'm not a writer and um i just want to say it was um it was really amazing to be his uh little baby brother uh yeah i'm not just gonna sit up here and break down on you but uh thanks for coming pat's a fucking champion and uh Always will be. Uh, just make no mistake, he'd want me to say this. He's not with God, he's fucking dead. He's not religious, so... Thanks for your thoughts, but he's fucking dead. <laughs> and when asked about his funeral speech uh, later, his brother said this. I, I don't regret any of that. I, you know, as far as what I was thinking, it just, uh... He's not what these people wished he was. Everyone grabbed at Pat's death. Not necessarily just the military. Everybody grabbed at him. They just chose the wrong family to try to do it in front of. And the U.S. military, they're having a hard time with the Tillmans because they're like, what don't you understand? Your son's death could be good for us. <laughs> and the Tillmans are like, no, we want the truth, actually, is what mm -hmm. we would like. And the U.S. military writes down in the official documentation that, oh, the reason they're having this reaction is because they're not religious, because you just believe that he's worm food now. That's probably like a hard thing to accept. And that's why they're reacting so poorly to our efforts to evangelize Pat. And it's like, no, they're reacting poorly because you're lying yeah. <laughs> and you're going against his express wishes <laughs> that's what's so crazy too is this family has to basically disprove that their own son is a war hero yes. which is such a just backwards position to be in so the easiest thing in the world would just be to accept this silver star and pat died a hero and saving lives and and instead they really like sift through mountains of paperwork and redacted documents and stuff to basically prove that he died for nothing which is just incredibly heartbreaking and his mom is so powerful in that documentary in particular oh yeah he she, talks about her a lot she She's a fucking G. The book does too. She's a teacher and she's burning her lunch breaks and her time off to call people in the military. They try and stonewall her by inundating her with too much information. They're like, oh, you want the truth? Here's 3,000 pages of documents, including ballistics reports, autopsies, every interview we conducted, and a scientific study of the light conditions in the canyon when it happened. Have fun, lady. And she fucking does. With the help of this, like, ex-Special Forces blog, that guy was awesome. That guy was fucking based <laughs> yeah, as shit. 
<laughs> also a Kennedy poster. Really? Yeah, oh, so really? Fly a side cut, but we don't need to go to that rabbit hole right now. <laughs> awesome. But yeah, Pat talks about his mom as like, there's this, I think maybe even in that, that interview right after 9-11 about how she's such an inspiration to him because she was the last person to finish the San Francisco Marathon. Mm-hmm. She was basically like, just decided she wanted to run this marathon and she got through it. She kind of powered her way through and that, that was like such an inspiration to Pat. And you really like see that come to life in this search for the truth about what happened to her son. You know, like you said, just like this death by paperwork, banker box after banker box arriving on their doorstep. And every single piece of it is redacted, said oh redacted to redacted. There's this crazy part where they're trying to figure out how many letters can fit into each blacked out uh, square. It's crazy what they're able to be handed and then reverse engineer into some semblance of what actually happened. Yeah. And she sees gross negligence. Like her initial reaction was, oh man, I feel so sorry for these guys who have killed my son because they're going to have to live with that guilt. And then as she mm-hmm. starts to decode the documents, she starts to see like, absolutely gross negligence people saying oh people were shooting i didn't want to miss the firefight and so i think what she would like to see is to see some of the officer class held accountable and maybe penalized yeah there was no taliban there how did you not have a handle on these guys right i think that's who she wants to see punished potentially but she does not get that justice this is where the cover-up starts and the u.s military is very interested in making sure that people do not know this is a friendly fire incident so right from the beginning we're told that the president has to be told ahead of time and donald rumsfeld that if they make a statement about pat do not technically admit that he was killed by the taliban you need to say something vague like he was killed while on a mission to eradicate the (laughs) taliban gotta love that nice passive voice he was killed (laughs) and the silver star is like the third highest honor in in army in army yeah and so it requires a write-up of what happened it's not like a purple heart or something sorry i have to say that i don't know why i'm (laughs) insulting the, the purple heart people out there So O'Neill, who's the guy who was pinned down with Pat, writes this very tepid, non-committal version that the army asks him to write. And then the army rewrites it and embellishes it so much that O'Neill is like, I'm not signing this. This isn't even a little bit what happened. And so the write-up for his Silver Star is submitted without a witness, which is normally always needed. And I think the most egregious and, and malicious part of this investigation is that Pat's possessions and uniform, which are supposed to be returned to the family, are put into an orange bag and then burned in an oil drum by like, a captain who's on a mission to destroy the evidence and his brother even explicitly asked him we need to get that notebook back to the family it's that's the one thing the family wants is his notepad and of course oil drum go burr <laughs> <laughs> Well, to be fair, most military procedures involve burning personal possessions in an oil drum. It's a category of cancer clusters. (laughs) (laughs) And no one is able to even offer an explanation for why they did this. They just said that it was highly irregular protocol. (laughs) God damn, it's so fucking grim. There's something like four or five different investigations into the Tillman case. And eventually they find one fall guy. They find this one general named uh, Kensington, I think was his name. Kensington. Kensinger, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Kensinger. 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 They they finally got Kissinger on (laughs) something. (laughs) <laughs> so they make Kensinger their fall guy, and he is already retired. The only penalty that he got is that he went from a three-star general to a two-star general, and he was already retired. But there was a leaked, essentially, email, like a, a something like, ugh, I hate these fucking military acronyms, like a P4 or something email? Anybody remember what P8? that was called? Yeah, was a, yeah, P4, P4 memo. Yeah, there's like a P4 memo that went out from Stanley McChrystal, I believe, that went out to every major general the idea of who knew it was a friendly fire the answer to that question is fucking everybody because for their propaganda tool they had to tell everyone hey don't go say he was killed by the taliban up to donald rumsfeld and the president but to give you an idea how on the radar pat tillman was there was a either leaked or a foia request memo from donald rumsfeld when pat tillman first enlisted and donald rumsfeld said this is a guy we need to keep an eye on and according to someone who worked in the rumsfeld dod this is the only soldier rumsfeld ever mentioned by name only individual soldier he ever mentioned by name in correspondence yeah of course as soon as he died everybody higher up knew exactly what happened and they hid it from the family and eventually the family does find this out through great personal effort and they get a hearing in front of congress where they can bring this up his family in this hearing they're they're exceptional is yeah his testimony and you know what in the end it, it leads to like absolutely nothing because everybody involved 
Valve just does the classic, I have no independent recollection of these events. Mm. I, I can't remember. Donald Rumsfeld is up there. Just, he's such a ghoul <laughs> in Congress being like, I don't, I don't recall. I don't recall ever hearing about Matt Tillman. <laughs> like, just, it's disgusting. Everyone happened to be traveling that day or something was a, a common refrain. Everyone was on holiday. <laughs> yeah, it's like everyone was unavailable by fax or whatever. Yeah. It's what the Green Day song was about, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a few guys get RFS, which is they get sent down to army from the Rangers, and that's kind of the limit of the punishments that are put out. So not great, Bob. Yep. So anyway, yeah, this is the end of our storytelling portion of the show of our very special episode, and now we'll move on to some of the big ideas. But this will probably be the more interesting part of the show. We don't really have themes here because it's not a work of art, but we will talk about some of the big ideas in the Pat Tillman story, and we'll start off with this idea of uh, cynicism versus is idealism. So the first big idea that we'd like to talk about is the conflict between cynicism and idealism. Because Pat Tillman is fundamentally an idealist in a very cynical world. And this is what makes his story so inspiring in that hokey way, is how idealistic he is. You know, this guy who turns down millions of dollars to serve. That's the tagline to his story. Even before 9-11 in the military, he's, he's turning down $9 million from the St. Louis Rams to keep playing for the cardinals yeah and by any value system that is stupid <laughs> right like nobody actually wants you to do that mm -hmm. who do you think you're helping by doing that the billionaire who owns the arizona cardinals nobody wants you to have morals about the team that drafted you and giving them that much of a discount yeah it's one thing if you're like tom brady who gets paid like a middle of the pack quarterback so that he can win more but there was no guarantee arizona would win that much more by pat tillman making the league minimum yeah and he could have played for the rams who were going to play in the super bowl that year against the patriots imagine if pat tillman had been the difference maker and ended tom brady's first super bowl run <laughs> imagine the world we might have lived in maybe philip rivers wins six Super Bowls. Uh, i think this is the greatest tragedy of it all <laughs> yeah truly he picks he off tom, tom Brady. brady's career yeah, yeah. exactly like he devastating the injury <laughs> It's like killing baby Hitler in his crib in 1898. <laughs> yeah, and this is the guy who marries his high school sweetheart. He's a star athlete at a different college, but he stays faithful in his long-distance relationship. He's got this idealistic code. So when we, the normies, who live in the world as it is, when we read Pat Tillman's stories, I think a lot of us are filled with a sense of awe. Maybe we're even inspired by this guy. But we're not going to do anything like he did, right? We're not going to tell our kids that Pat Tillman is a role model because we're so cynical we would say something like what the fuck are you doing he should have been more cynical and selfish objectively football is a blood sport get paid for it don't enlist at all <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Al. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think this also illustrates that, like, the NFL and the military have this parallel where young, dumb, and full of cum optimism <laughs> is a large part of the recruiting drive, right? Yep. And I think Pat Tillman thematically is this parallel where he's just like, yeah, I'm really stoked, man. Just happy to be here and takes that energy to its perhaps uh, darkest logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. It's by far the professional sports league that's the most intertwined with the military. Yeah. I don't, I haven't seen as many salute to services at the uh, basketball or hockey games and i think this is why the story is so engaging to so many people because he does seem like a man out of place out of time in our society that's why he stands out because our entire society is so cynical we're not about self-sacrifice for the greater good we are about self-interest and even when you do behave with self-sacrifice it's clear that you're not going to be able to accomplish your goals you're not going to be able to fight on the beaches of normandy in afghanistan because it's an occupation it's mission it's like yeah it's like it's like a complex occupation mission and so you're not going to get the satisfaction that you want out of this experience yeah i mean i think that that's a parallel to the, the, like the generation kill stuff or jarhead or whatever all these young men seeking some great war or some noble cause to throw their lives behind and it just doesn't exist in that way and i think that disillusion was pretty apparent pretty much immediately is that we're, we're really uh, there's some quote from him he says he hopes it's not about oil and power but he <laughs> expects that it is yeah like, yeah that's the dark truth of this whole thing Thank you. 
you're not really here for any real reason. Even the fundamental like logic of invading Afghanistan is sort of revenge, right, at its core. It's not really the liberation of, of those people. I mean, I think it's sort of like that that catalyst is pretty inherently dark. And then I think, yeah, he wanted to make an impact and do some good in the world and then found himself in a place where it's impossible to, really. You're, you're not really there for any any purpose other than serving as a pawn for these things that he didn't even believe in. But there's some, so, some part of him that still wanted to be a part of this bigger thing, right? Like he's seeking some thing purpose. to sort of throw himself behind purpose. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the saddest, right? This whole generation of just, there is no great war. And for someone like Pat, I think he really can't just sit with his own selfishness. Like football doesn't fill him up mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It doesn't feel important enough in the, the, the big picture. Yeah, and just talking about how he doesn't fit in our society, it's really interesting. I always think about the fact that Vietnam draft dodgers in elections are batting a thousand in presidential elections. And Vietnam veterans are batting zero. <laughs> It's this thing where we hold up Pat's self-sacrifice as being this noble thing, and yet that's never reflected in the way that Americans actually vote, right? So first you got Clinton, draft dodger, beating H.W. Bush, who served in World War II, then Clinton beating Bob Dole, who served in World War II, then George W. Bush beating Al Gore, who served in Vietnam, then George W. Bush beating Kerry, who served in Vietnam. I mean, George Bush putting up back-to-back -back Vietnam War veteran victories, you know, that he, he really should have the nickname Viet Cong. George or something because he can't stop beating Vietnam vets. He stayed winning because he got to do cocaine and fly planes with his friends in Texas. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's, he seems like a cool guy. I don't know. Like, you don't want to have a beer with him. Famously, yes. And then Obama beats McCain, who, who was in Vietnam. We've talked about him before. To be fair, McCain actually negligently discharged a, a missile on the deck of an aircraft carrier, and he literally only got to become a pilot because his uncle was Secretary of Na the Navy. Comrade McCain doing anti-imperialism <laughs> on the deck <laughs> trying to sink his own ship yeah yeah and then we got trump who who dra drafted vietnam to beat hillary and then we had biden versus trump and so yeah the only way to beat a draft dodger is to be a draft dodger <laughs> and, so we... <laughs> and then i mean jordan we know he didn't really win that election <laughs> <laughs> right true <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making fun of these people for draft dodging. I think that that was the right call for them to do. I'm glad that, I guess, like these people avoided service. <laughs> but all I'm saying is that America's voting patterns don't reflect the ostensible values that they hold so dearly. Mm -hmm. I think it's especially funny. I mean, yeah, Pat Tobin shows us the risks and pitfalls of too much idealism in a cynical world, which is you get taken for a fucking run. But I think it's especially funny. It, it occurred to me, we, we recorded an episode on the Tea Party a couple weeks ago. Glenn Beck will go on these unhinged rants about how any and all forms of service for the greater good or the community, anyone outside your family cult compound <laughs> is bad and un-American. But these people are still holding up Pat Tillman. There's like a great Fox News bit that maybe I'll put here in post where Ann Coulter is talking up how great Pat Tillman is. And someone who's on the panel show with her says, this dude liked Chomsky and was going to come back and vote for John Kerry. And Ann Coulter, just cognitive dissonance, like, no, someone who served like that could never be a lib so that, that, that could never happen she just says i don't believe that's true and yeah. it's like it is it's <laughs> fundamental you know it's in his like all of his writing and yeah exactly like he can still be a hero to these people who just fundamentally would disagree with him they read some of the stuff he was saying not in the greater context of the tillman story right timeline wise you can also only assume that ann coulter was thinking about getting dicked by pillman by tillman when she was with bill maher just <laughs> putting that out there <laughs> She was with Bill Maher? Dude, Ann Coulter was with Bill Maher, man. Yeah. Oh, man, of all the sexes that I don't want to imagine, that's got to be up there. <laughs> New rule. I'm coming and uh, you don't have to come anymore. <laughs> okay, so we'll get to our second section here, which is who killed Pat Tillman and why? Who shot PT? So, yeah, if we were to be as generous as possible, a generous good faith reading of the U.S. military's conduct in the Pat Tillman saga, is that they, one, were incompetent as fuck and got their star recruit murdered. Two, that they then maliciously covered up their incompetence. Three, that they lied about their death and put pressure on the family to score a propaganda victory. That's the most forgiving <laughs> best case scenario. That's as squeaky clean as they could come out. There's a worse reading. <laughs> and I think Al from Brooklyn might want to pop off on this. Yeah, so I think, and just to 
preface this with, I personally think that it was just military incompetence in a firefight. And I think you have guys who are basically bored, but also like piked up that like, okay, the Taliban's behind every every ridge line that they ice Pat Tillman by just sheer incompetence. But there's a couple of details specifically that there's a possibility that one of the people in the element that advanced forward with Tillman accidentally discharged their M16 towards the direction of the people firing on them. And that might've hit him in the base of the skull. Best case scenario, again, generation kill callback. If you are aware of the incident where Trombley uh, shoots those two Iraqi shepherd boys, that's probably what happened where someone let off like a couple bursts from a saw and really, really crushed their marksmanship machine gunning uh, module. So, you know, <laughs> like he got zipper line three in the head. But I think because of General McChrystal specifically, but the U.S. military and Bush PR apparatus more broadly and their actions here, much like other things where there's an Occam's razor element or stupidity is the best in our explanation, I think people want to see more. And if you go on, I think I've noticed it's both QAnon and really, really intercept brained people currently. Those two segments of people will swear that Pat Tillman was murdered for wanting to meet with Chomsky and specifically Rumsfeld knowing Pat Tillman individually and him being one of the few soldiers that Rumsfeld mentioned explicitly is some sort of malicious indication. I personally think it's stupidity, but I think if you lie for so long, malice will come to the surface as an explanation. So I think that's ultimately what happened with a section of the internet and Pat Tillman. Right. And I guess if you have enough people who are willing to go along with this cover up of burning his clothes, it's also not that much harder to imagine that maybe he instructed to, to be killed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't look good when you go destroying evidence. Right. I'm picturing the true detective Rust Cole scene where he's like, we got to make this look right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's shooting the the saw along the ridge line and building this false narrative. I think I'm with you guys. The most obvious answer is just this is a bunch of incompetent, fired up 18 year olds who like once some shooting starts, it's impossible to get them to stop until it's too late, right? Everyone wants to be in the firefight. That's like they're all quoted as saying time and time again. But yeah, I mean, there's also it's hard not to read into all these steps taken to cover it up and not feel like there's I mean, they were very aware, right, that like they were losing this narrative when he comes home, that he's going to appear on these podcasts who's or whatever the version of a podcast was. And <laughs> An NPR time, interview, good sir. <laughs> <laughs> An NPR <laughs> He was going to start calling out the war is illegal and that, that basically couldn't happen, right? He wasn't going to be their Elvis anymore. It was, you know, he's mm-hmm. going to be sort of a threat to them. And then I think there's also just weird stuff with this story that his brain went missing. <laughs> Which is also famously happened to JFK, another person who died under completely normal circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of weird stuff, right? Like we said, like the tapes being taped over. Like, there's just a long history of that, obviously, just in the military in general. Of just if anyone can keep this lie going, it, it's that apparatus, right? But yeah, I mean, I think ultimately the, the sadder, more likely scenario is these guys wanted to shoot. There is a qui bono type of approach you could take to say that if Pat comes back, and Al, you mentioned that that you could see him becoming a sort of a, uh, a Jesse Ventura-like figure. Yeah, no, I mean, he'd just be like this unimaginably swole-based, has Chomsky on his weekly access radio show over his constituents. There's an alternate universe where I think Pat Tillman becomes governor of, or at least a congressman, doing just base shit. Maybe he's hanging with Barbara Lee in Fremont. Maybe he, like, decides to take over Montana. Who knows? But I think he really... <laughs> does have a pretty high ceiling when he comes back to do things that are politically inconvenient for the Bush administration. Yeah. And you could never undermine him. Because of his self-sacrifice, you could never undermine him by pointing, like, if he speaks up against the war, you can't say uh, what you would do to John Kerry, right? Mm-hmm. Which was like, yeah, you right. know, you were swift-boated, or I don't know, like, <laughs> you can't swift-boat Fli- him. Flip-flopping. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I beg to differ. If you gave any of those Rangers a weekend in Vegas, they would swift-boat the fuck out of that <laughs> True, <dude>. true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And someone in the docks one of his fellow rangers said they thought he had his eye on politics. And I don't think Pat ever said that, but they see NFL athlete walking away to join the military. He's got to have his eye on, on something bigger. So some people around him thought that. Yeah. Yeah. They gave him a really hard time about that during training because they kind of thought this is clearly just for show. I was just imagining my uncles during this part because they'll say stuff like, you know, like I was imagining, the, you know, doing the, the typical uncle thing of being like, why does LeBron James make $20 million a year? Yeah. The guys who shot Pat Tillman should be making that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Also, speaking of conspiracies, I just want to shout out something. The difference between a physical media and an audiobook. So I read Where Men Win Glory back in 2015, and I was speed reading it to prep for this pod. So I had the Audible running at 3.5 speed, and then I had the book open so I could follow along. And every now and then, the voice actor, the reader, would skip ahead and just totally skip sections of the book. And I would like to read one of these missing sections, one of these phantom sections that the 
reader just skipped over John Krakauer's words. In order to launch a full-scale assault on Iraq, however, the president first had to convince the American people that Saddam posed a direct threat to the United States. In 2002, according to Scott McClellan, an entity called the White House Iraq Group, WIG, was set up to coordinate the marketing of the war. As McClellan reported in What Happened, his memoir about serving as Bush's press secretary, WIG was the cornerstone of, quote, a political propaganda campaign to sell the war to the American people. Karl Rove led the group, which included Karen Hughes, Mary Madeline, Condoleezza Rice, Stephen Hadley, Scooter Libby, Michael Gerson, Ari Fleischer, and Jim Wilkinson, whom we mentioned above. A rising star in the Republican political ranks who toiled as a deputy director of communications for the president, Wilkinson wrote a background paper for the unforgettable speech Bush made to the United Nations General Assembly on September 12, in which the president declared that Saddam's regime was a grave and gathering danger. Yeah, so I wonder why that got cut. I wonder why Jeff Bezos cut that from the audible version of Where Men Win Glory. I guess we will never know. There's also a great part in the audiobook where the guy doing the voiceover has to say some things that these Afghan National Army guys are saying, Mm -hmm. and he does a very problematic impersonation of of these guys. I think I've recorded a clip. that That guy, he has done some bad things against me. If someone is bad to me, I must be bad to them. You know why? Because if you didn't, that guy will think you are a pussy guy, and then he will be bothering you all the time. You have to go against him back, you know? I am telling you, if the guy does something wrong and you didn't do something back against him, after this he will have no respect for you. He will think you are a pussy motherfucker. It's very, yeah, it's pretty out there. Yeah, our next big idea is the complexity and contradictions of Pat Tillman, i.e. what makes this guy interesting study for a biography. So, Cards on the Table, Where Men Win Glory is legitimately one of my favorite nonfiction books because the author captures this fascinating human being that's warts and all. Like, it would be so fucking easy to write a biography of Pat Tillman that was just total hagiography, right? He's selfless. He's an elite athlete. He's ambitious. He's perfect. It's like what you hear Kim Jong-il did about how he, like... He has a big penis. He fucks the best. (laughs) Yep, yep. (laughs) It would be so easy to do it. But John Krakauer doesn't shy away from some of the really explicitly negative traits of Tillman. Like, he loves drinking. He gets too drunk sometimes. And he pukes red wine into his wife's suitcase while they're on vacation in Paris. This guy drunkenly walks around Paris literally saying the idiot American thing, you'd all be speaking German if it weren't for us. <laughs> Krakauer makes clear like he's arrogant and reckless. I think it's no accident that his last words that Krakauer loves to say is, don't you know who I am? I'm Pat fucking Tillman. Which on the one hand you could read as stop shooting, <laughs> which is probably how he meant it, but if you also think that you're invisible invincible excuse me you know this kind of arrogance this hubris and i think that crack hour is clearly really ambivalent about pat tillman it's like the selflessness and the arrogance the discipline and the unruliness it's just like his other book into the wild where crack hour has respect for this guy chris mccandless who left our fake ass bullshit world to go and try and live off the land but crack hour also thinks that he's a fucking idiot who got himself killed who was out of his depth like a very similar portrayal of the figure yep and and I think it would be very easy, like you said, to turn this into a hagiography. Because like, if you look at a picture of Pat Tillman, especially once he's in the army, he looks like a G.I. Joe model. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a square jaw, corn fed, <laughs> swole lad. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to be cast in the upcoming American Dad live action TV show. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of people assumed Army 9-11 square jaw that you, you kind of know who he is. And you come to learn that not only is he a lot more sensitive than you thought, but that he's not a hero and doesn't want to be. And mm-hmm. like I said, that's one area where I think the family was was almost like, well, not almost, they were extremely put off at the idea of people only speaking about his virtues because they were like, that's not who my, like, that's not our actually past that's some vision of him you've conjured yeah that's so true and he is an impressive guy for sure like they talk about how he's running marathons and triathlons in the off season they talk about how he's picking away at a master's in history which are things that might surprise you again if you only saw that gi joe ass picture but i especially like reading the letter that he writes to his mom and his uncle when he's off at college right when he's 18 years old and he's fucking lonely it's all there it's the portrayal of the person in and all their glory and all their uh, the opposite of glory. Worse than <laughs> all. Pretty much across the board, too, everyone that talked with Pat said that he was incredibly open-minded mm-hmm. and would ask them tons of questions. And 
they said he wasn't super dogmatic in his beliefs. You could convince him of things that he, you know, might otherwise like before the conversation of like thought differently. And that seems like at odds with this very like principle driven guy. But he also, like you said, had this more sensitive and like, introspective side. And I think he was really genuinely interested in the people around him and, and learning more. I think even Chomsky, like it's easy to say that he was perfectly aligned with him. And that was what made him a threat or something. But a lot of people that were close to him said that he didn't necessarily agree with Chomsky on everything either, but he just liked him as a thinker and kind of was interested in talking with someone on an intellectual level that he related with. Yeah. He famously like had read, I think, uh, you know, the Bible, the Quran and the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. He would just mm -hmm. read things to to expand his perspective. And apparently, yeah, the, the works of Noam Chomsky. The fourth big idea we have here is... Uh... Pat's obsession with challenging himself, which we've hit a lot of these notes already, right? Yeah, but elite athlete, marathons, triathlons, soldier, and not just any old soldier, but the fucking Rangers, the elite, the special forces. Yeah, and this is probably one of my favorite stories about this obsession that he had with challenging himself. He saw everything as like a personal challenge that he could never be satisfied. There's a story about him and his brother, and they used to go to Tahoe a lot because they're NorCal people. And there's a, a tree just off the edge of a cliff, and Pat says to his brother, I bet you i can jump and catch that tree and then climb down it and pat's brother is like w but why <laughs> and pat does it he jumps off the clip and he almost misses the tree and as a result he kind of bungles the catch a little bit but saves himself and goes down and then later when they're passing that same spot he goes i'm gonna do it again because i didn't do it perfect last time <laughs> and his brother's like why there's no benefit and you could be risking your nfl career by doing this and he's just like because it's there <laughs> i'm like it's a, it is it, it is a personal challenge and this is the code in which i operate for ill or for benefit leroy <laughs> jenkins <laughs> <laughs> yes it's it's yeah. so funny that this tree in tahoe is his mount everest <laughs> like, <laughs> like why pat because it's there because it yeah. overhangs a cliff and like i was reading through it this morning it's like a 10 foot jump it is close to the world record for long jump <laughs> oh, is how Jesus. far away it was <laughs> from the ledge and there's nobody there it's not like he's doing this to like, impress his girlfriend or something it's pat and his brother yeah and it's just like yeah this this man had such like, an interesting world view and sense of motivation even the drinking they talk about like in france wherever it was like the waiter said that there were some americans or something in last night who had like six bottles of wine each and he was oh. like bet <laughs> you know like even that came out of a competition right like i mean i think he just did everything to the max right to like prove it to himself that he could also do this or he could do this perfectly and yeah like you said objectively sick stuff like jumping onto a tree with a 60 foot gap <laughs> and and throwing up in your girlfriend's suitcase because you had six bottles because you had to beat you strangers know? in a story whom you never <laughs> met before <laughs> Yeah, and I think there's another way of reading this story where it's not the idealistic pursuit of the greater good. It's like a more selfish pursuit of personal achievement and glory. Like, I don't think it's an accident that Krakauer named his book with a title from the Iliad, a poem about war, about personal greatness, about reputation, and gave it the subtitle, The Odyssey of Pat Tillman. You could read this just as a story of hubris and arrogance, and eventually, if you are this reckless and headstrong, Strong and challenge yourself the bill's gonna come due which it eventually did yeah if that's all we have for his obsession with challenging himself we'll move on to our penultimate section which is pat tillman as taliban <laughs> our most provocative <laughs> section. this is our yeah. most provocative section which is hanging out with uh golbity and heck with yar <laughs> yeah, uh, shout yeah. out to the blowback <laughs> podcast yeah <laughs> he is uh we've been calling this section the pat taliban section because whether or not john crocker was trying to i think he was he was trying to do this but he talks a lot about the values of the taliban Taliban, and then we'll go back to Pat, where it seems like he's sort of embodying some of these values. And I think that he is drawing like an implicit comparison between Tillman and the Taliban. Yeah, like we've said, this is a guy with totally out of place, out of time values, much like the Taliban. And it's so provocative because we don't want to imagine this SoCal atheist hippie insisting on men being compelled to grow out their beards and women being forced to wear the burqa. But we're, we really mean this from the sense of worldview. So early on in the book, Krakow 
Hightower describes a few of these Pashtun virtues. So stuff like Nong, honor. I apologize for mangling Pashtun. Gairat, pride. And Badal, revenge. Badal. Uh, Badal, nice. Plus another one, Melmastia, hospitality. And throughout the book, we see Pat exhibit all of these in one way or another. Honor, pride, revenge, and hospitality. That is what he practices. I mean, he goes to Afghanistan for revenge. He has a tremendous amount of pride and a tremendous amount of honor. But beyond that, the Taliban are hard fucking men. And so is Pat Tillman. The Taliban choose a life of discomfort and misery and self-sacrifice, much like Pat Tillman. Yeah, and I want to talk about another guy who gave up a million dollar a year contract to sleep outdoors and train. And (laughs) I'm not going to actually say his name, but I just want you to imagine who this guy could be. A certain gentleman who had a million dollar a year allowance. (laughs) A certain Saudi Arabian. (laughs) child of a construction magnate he kind of had that classic 38th child personality yeah children born in the the third quintile they always operate a certain way you know they like to keep them didn't want to work with his dad's construction business so i'm sophomore's <laughs> demolition guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean there's something really interesting about this idea of the taliban are driven by these ideals in a way that the average american infantryman might not be and i think there's a lot of that in the book too of him being really disillusioned about being in this tent with the these 18 year old kids huffing computer duster and just basically being total menaces you know or people who are like otherwise they're just because they really want a communications degree and they don't really give a shit about anything else right it's just it's a means to an end versus pat who feels it's some sort of higher calling and i think that parallel is really strong i'm not saying it would be like a homeland situation where pat comes back and is actually secretly a taliban operative <laughs> but i think the parallels are strong of just the sense of like this higher calling or something right like you know and i think that there weren't a lot of people even in his unit that felt called in that way it was just sort of this was a job or this was like a thing that they did because it was like they had a family history of it or there weren't people that were necessarily as driven as pat except for this group of seals who they would go hang out with in their tent filming and his brother nub and they would have coffee and talk with these guys about plato <laughs> which is pretty crazy yeah and i think that crack makes the point that he might have been more at home in a unit that was sort of more like-minded like that that kind of found himself just surrounded by like, these guys he thought were incompetent or went there for the right reasons or that is like peak military though like you join thinking you're gonna do some meaningful shit and then like you get put by a a faceless bureaucracy in in a meaningful task or function or billet so i think that's a thing that tillman really experienced your point additionally we're talking about earlier i think pat tillman and you know islamist militias and really a lot of organizations around the world do rely on insecure men and male listlessness directionlessness alienation call it whatever you like to exist right and i think whether it's people in suburban california who are like getting part of the friday night lights uh, to maybe finger bang a female (laughs) to you know like someone joining al-shabaab or the taliban the actual psychological motivation for an individual young man between the ages of 15 and 25 is approximately the same like there's deviations in that sort of thing but i mean impulse to do something patriotic and badass is something that i think a lot of young men have been at least exposed to if not outright swindled by So the Pat Tillman story, this man who is so hard, reminds me a lot of a story from early Roman times, before the foundation of the Republic even. Rome was being besieged by a foreign Etruscan king named Lars Porcena, and the Romans wanted to send an assassin on a suicide mission to kill this foreign king. And they find a guy named Gaius Mucius Skyvola, Skyvola, the V's, the W's, though he hadn't earned that third name yet. And they tell him, this is a one-way trip, you ain't coming back. And so Gaius Mucius sneaks into the camp he kills the wrong guy on accident he's hauled before Lars Porcena and Lars tells him to go back to Rome and demand a surrender and Gaius Mucius thrusts his hand over a burning brazier and burns his right hand down to a stub and while he does this he's you know looking at Lars Porcena dead in the eye he's not flinching and he tells Lars Porcena I was one of 300 volunteers for this one-way suicide mission that's the kind of people that you are besieging right now and he essentially alpha doms his way into King Lars porcena retreating because the romans to a man each and every one of them are hard as a motherfucker yeah and so we're imagining a salafis dan carlin (laughs) who's like i've just told you the story of lars porcena but what if what if there was an entire nation of pat tillman's (laughs) we have one pat tillman what if there was an entire country of them What if a man's faith was so strong they could never be defeated? We talk a lot on this program about technology and how important it is. But what if faith was more important than technology? (laughs) 
our last little big idea here, which is the U.S. Army as bureaucracy. And so you, you actually did kind of anticipate it, what we were going to say. The event that kills Pat Tillman has to do with this Rube Goldberg gears turning of bureaucracy that comes down to, we need to split this company into two because A of all, we need to preserve our gear and B of all, we need to preserve our gear and still complete the mission. And the thing is, there's no time crunch on this mission. It's an occupation in a war that's going to go for 20 years. It's just so that some bureaucrat can say Day, we completed 12 percent more missions this quarter as compared to last quarter yeah when they were doing the investigation they asked why didn't you just have the entire company stay with the humvee well we needed to search the village and they were like well what if you didn't search the village today and you had to do it tomorrow and they were like well, uh, well nothing i guess we wouldn't be able to check it off the list and then we can't complete 12 percent more missions this quarter compared to last quarter there is no reason to rush this we are in a 22 year occupation <laughs> we got time look 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 the commanding officer has a really bad divorce with his dependipotamus he has a really really <laughs> shitty terms of payment on that truck he needed that promo bro yes exactly you're only fulfilling the bureaucratic needs of the army more than you are like, any like, mission criticalness yeah the primary need of the army which is winning wars <laughs> it's the optics it's looking yeah. like you're doing something the other great u.s army as bureaucracy point in here was the internal investigation into pat tillman's death was i think a masterful political cover generating stroke because the way that they did it gives everybody involved plausible deniability because what happens is of course it's fratricide everybody who was there knows this but the u.s military needs to buy time so that people forget about this story so the family is saying was it fratricide can you tell us if it was fratricide and the u.s military responds we don't want to say it's fratricide until we know 100 percent so we are waiting for the investigation to conclude and then every time the investigation is ready to close they just end the investigation and start a new one and so they're able to do this four or five times and the entire time they can put their hands up and say we need to wait for the results of the investigation in order to say anything despite the fact that everybody involved knew it was friendly fire anyone who was there knew that it was friendly fire yeah just kick that can down the road yeah and i mean and just the idea of the taliban offering to give us bin laden is a very darkly funny part of this entire war is at the beginning the taliban saying we won't give you bin laden directly we'll give it to a third party because one of the, their main issues with giving it directly to the united states was you have guantanamo Guantanamo Bay. We don't want him ending up in Guantanamo Bay, which is so dark and appropriate that the thing that gets the U.S. involved in this war is their like, extrajudicial like, torture, torture black hole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just the fact that us going into Afghanistan is exactly what bin Laden wanted. That's reiterated in this book, I think, a few times that bin Laden wanted the United States to invade because like, you can actually fight the United States in Afghanistan, whereas doing it from, from Afghanistan was difficult. Yeah, I mean, other podcasters have pointed this out before. This is not an original Ben take, but 9-11 really is the most successful terrorist attack in history. Did you make America erode its freedoms with the Patriot Act? Check. Did you drag the U.S. into a military quagmire? It couldn't win in check twice actually did you make americans terrified think that they were gonna die in a terrorist attack in a fucking kroger check and also like i, I think it's been observed that like if you're playing like a you know board game of like war on terror like a win condition for bin laden or the terrorist side would probably be trump getting elected you know, like <laughs> it's like oh the, the deeply anti-intellectual guy who is telling you to ban people from the u.s that's the guy so i think critical support for uh no i'm kidding um <laughs> but but yeah i mean that isi officer who got paid uh snitching shout out to that guy i hope he's uh in a nice californian suburb like fremont <laughs> <laughs> And imagine believing so much in this end of history idea to think that you will be doing these countries a favor by invading them and be like, we're going to go to Iraq and Afghanistan and we're going to turn it into South Korea and Japan. I, I remember them saying, especially after they discovered a shitload of like mineral wealth under Afghanistan. Yeah, rare earth metals. Rare earth metals. Yeah, it's going to be Switzerland with minarets. Sam Huntington is actually famously one of the people who made that argument who's definitely never done anything weird <laughs> we'll talk about like faith in liberal democracy that is so strong that you sincerely believe that it will be the best thing that ever happened to this country <laughs> yeah brutal okay closing thoughts on pat taliban pat tillman it's a fascinating story 
I would legitimately recommend if you were interested, just read the book that we read to prep for this, Where Men Win Glory by John Krakauer. It's excellent. You get really get a sense for the guy. It is brutally tragic, though. Can you imagine the life that he might have had, whether or not he enlists? The life he might have had if he doesn't die in a friendly fire accident. And, you know, maybe he, he comes here and he becomes the next John Kerry, a veteran critic of the war who would go on to lose a presidential election. Or maybe he just plays football and raises a kid with his or a couple of kids with his childhood sweetheart. At uh, least one Joe Rogan podcast interview would have oh, happened. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Bro, that's crazy. We're still seeing Pat Tillman stories every Super Bowl. There's still like Kevin Costner doing VO about the sacrifices that great Americans make over that nine. 12 interview that he did a day after 9 11 pat tillman knew he could do more he gave up his nfl career to join the u.s army rangers and ultimately lost his life in the line of duty like tillman dave prakash felt compelled to serve after 9 11 when i was 29 i was a doctor but i felt i needed to do more so i put my medical career aside and joined the air force his likeness and his image is still being used to pump up the crowd before a military flyover. And it's just, it's really dark. It's really, he's grown to symbolize sort of whatever you want him to, to symbolize. He's either this really tragic figure or he's this really heroic figure. And and I think Krakauer does a good job of talking about this in the book too, but just can kind of be whatever you want him to be. And he kind of just serves as this backdrop for your own ideas. And I think every time the Super Bowl is on and I see that horrible Pat Tillman statue <laughs> where he's got the helmet off and it looks, his face Dude, is like, his- Flowing locks, man. Pain. Motherfucker looks like Brendan Fraser's <laughs> Tarzan. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so cynical this mm-hmm. idea at its core that a guy who would want nothing to do with any of this is basically the poster child potentially recruiting more malleable young men into conflicts that they ultimately will regret being yeah. part of. It's sad that like, he's still being used as this tool for this thing that he kind of fundamentally was against. And it's crazy. Think about how many other Pat Tillman style deaths probably happen in the military. We read mm-hmm. the official friendly fire numbers, but we have this information we have the truth only because he was already a big famous guy so we had some media scrutiny his brother was in the unit as an eyewitness and he had this insanely tenacious family most people would have given up so those three things those stars had to align in order for us to get the truth out how many other pat Tillmans might be out there yeah if his brother isn't in the unit does it ever get out it's it's tough to say because it was difficult enough even with his brother literally a few hundred feet away and it was still tough to figure out what happened and i think that pat in the end is a very symbolic figure for the war in iraq if you're looking for like, someone who embodies the conflict as a person the same way that you might be able to look at Kerry like, with vietnam or like, kennedy with world war ii pat's story is the story of a guy who was killed because of friendly fire someone from our own side doing us in and the cover-up too is very illustrative of how we ended up in Iraq in the first place and how our efforts went over there. So he is really the perfect figure for this story in a very dark way. No, and coming back to that, Jordan, I think one of the things to think about is the timeline where all this happened, where you go right from kind of the post-patriotic fervor of uh, 9-11 into people being sick of and skeptical of the Iraq war, just as like the insurgency starts kicking off, is kind of the timeline of his service. So he's kind of, again, to your point, it's a personification of the expected propaganda versus actual actually testing that with the reality. So I guess, you know, fuck around and find out is always a principle that catches up to you. And I think it is what happens when optimism meets real cynicism. That's perfect. That's a perfect bow, Al. All right. So with that being said, we- thank you so much for joining our first very special episode. <laughs> yeah. I hope uh, I, I hope you Sorry learned. if you wanted to hear an episode about the Gili or, <laughs> you know, the Boondock Saints or something. But we figured we'd try something new. I hope if you didn't get a few laughs from our bits, from our gallows humor bits, I hope you at least learned a thing or two and you were you know entertain hopefully we could at least make you angry which is that's why i listen to podcasts to be pissed off (laughs) so huge thank you to our guests tommy and al thank you so much for coming on the pod thank you guys thank you i appreciate it like it's it's huge when we can have a a guest on who is willing to like read a book read a book that's crazy (laughs) yeah and if if you do want to hear more uh, from al be sure to check out episode 10 or 11 on uh the reading series we did on like megan mccardle and other iraq war cheerleaders all right it's been your remember shuffle please like subscribe we respond to every comment tag us on instagram we'll reshare it tell your friends about our pod we are legitimately proud of it (laughs) (laughs) all right yeah peace ciao peace ciao